this case involves the horrific... I do not understand in what world... Oh, sorry, oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Did you lie to the police? She holds the world. She needs to be punished for what she's done. The following stories tell the tale of three deranged babysitters who did horrible things to children. This disturbing story begins in March of 2018. Hannah Weshi was a sweet and adorable three-year-old girl with her entire life ahead of her. Her mother was hooked on illegal substances before she was even born, so her dad was her primary caregiver, and he worked hard to provide a good life for her. Her father dropped her off with a babysitter he believed he could trust to care for his beloved daughter. The babysitter, was Lindsay Parton, a woman in her 30s who from outside looked perfectly kind and normal. She was even a mother herself. What nobody could have realized was that there was a serious darkness beneath her surface. One day, 911 dispatchers received a frantic phone call from Lindsay, claiming that Hannah was in trouble. Lindsay would later tell police that Hannah had simply begun to take off her jacket when she collapsed. At first, she believed she had tripped and told her to get back up. Of course, police had no immediate reason to assume Lindsay had done anything to hurt Hannah because children commonly stumble or accidentally hurt themselves, as Judge Brandon Birmingham explained. What happens in these cases is you'll have some type of an explanation, usually an innocent explanation, because we've all been around kids. We all know that uh, kids fall down, they get bumps and they get bruises, and that's something that we've all shared in our common experience. But it wasn't until law enforcement got a look at Hannah and the extent of her injuries that they realized something much more serious than a child simply tripping or jumping off a couch had occurred. While Lindsay was at the police station being questioned, and before she knew the full extent of Hannah's condition, she seemed to allude that something must have happened to Hannah before she ever came into her care. She hinted that maybe Hannah's father hadn't been paying attention to her and something had happened while he wasn't looking, but her story didn't make sense or match up with Hannah's grave injuries. Lindsay would soon find out just how severe Hannah's condition was. The detective investigating the case soon gave it to her straight. Hey, Whatever happened to her happened to me. She has a severe, severe injury. Hannah has a Lindsay seemed totally taken aback and shocked, or at least that's how she pretended to be. She repeatedly promised that she was telling the truth in regards to what had happened to little Hannah. The detective explained to her that despite her claims, the situation wasn't looking very good for her. It was looking right now as if this happened at your house because we need, we need to find out. I swear to God, I'm telling you the exact truth. We walked in the house. She did not walk, she did not fall. It was clear that the detective wasn't buying her story, and Lindsay continued to claim that she did nothing to hurt the little girl, but that she just simply fell over. Detective Lambert, another officer investigating the case, told Lindsay right to her face that she believed she had been lying. I believe you're not being honest with us, and you need to compliment it. Unfortunately, while doctors did everything they could to save her life, Hannah would pass away just 10 days later while in the hospital. Her loved ones were of course devastated by the sudden loss. Judge Brandon Birmingham described this as a classic case of child abuse. Babies, toddlers, they don't just die all of a sudden. They were able to observe things that are pathognomonic for child abuse. In other words, the only explanation for the existence of these observable injuries retinal hemorrhages, brain swelling, is inflicted trauma. Things were clearly not looking good for Lindsay, and she was appearing more and more guilty by the minute. How was she ever going to talk herself out of this situation? While she claimed she would never hurt Hannah, Hannah's father, Jason, told a different story. He had been suspicious that something was going on with Hannah and Lindsay even before this incident occurred, but he had no evidence to prove it. Jason saw us that she had thrown a lot at your house. But Lindsay tried to spin the story and say that. That's completely unjust. 
two men out, so there's this. Police were now in a position in which they had to choose who to believe, Lindsay or Hannah's own father. Sergeant Whitlock, who was investigating the case, was the one who broke the news to Lindsay that Hannah had passed away. This child was beat. This is abuse. They just pulled the plug on this child. This child is dead. Upon hearing the news, Lindsay cried out and put her head in her hands in shock. Sergeant Whitlock continued to be blunt with her regarding what was going to happen next. If you're sitting here telling the truth, that's great. But if you're sitting here and you're covering and you know things, listen to the words I'm going to tell you. You will be yeah. There's absolutely no positive way that this child was sitting down playing, having conversations that it absolutely could not have happened. Attorney Catherine Smith weighed in on the issue. It is highly unlikely that she would have been able to have been injured the day before because treating doctors specifically stated that the blows to her head would have resulted within seconds or minutes. She wouldn't have been able to be functioning. Still, Lindsay stuck to her original story. She claimed she had not only never hurt Hannah, but any kid ever. I will love you, and I've never hurt a kid in my whole life. What you hurt my kids, I don't spank, I don't believe in spanking, I was crazy It was then that she was presented with photographs that depicted Hannah's graphic injuries. Somehow, she could think of an explanation for each one. She could point to every bruise and recall the incident that led to the mark. In one case, she said Hannah fell without bracing herself with her hands and ended up with a bruise on her chin. While police understood that it is normal for little children to get bumps and bruises a lot. Hannah's injuries did not appear to be as if they could have been self-inflicted by falls or other similar instances. Her injuries were not only severe, but they were on places on her body that wouldn't make sense to have been caused by simply falling down. Detective Turner explained to Lindsay why they didn't believe Hannah's injuries were caused by a fall. So when people fall, um, you're going to have bruising on the sharp points. If you fall straight forward, you're not going to have bruising over here. And that's what that's what we're getting. That's why we wanted to come down and fill in some of these holes. Yeah. Um, because, I, I mean, honestly, a lot of these aren't adding up to the fall on the gravel. After being presented with this information, Lindsay suddenly decides to add to her story. She shares a new detail that she strangely didn't think to tell police about in the beginning. So I slept under a blanket, I opened the door, and we both went down. I was clear on the left side. When I slipped, it hit her side. I actually hit my head on the door coming down, but she smacked her face, her whole, her, her head really hard on the concrete step. Yeah, I know. She fell. Understandably, police were confused about why Lindsay would have held on to this important detail for so long. When they asked her why she had hidden this, she broke down in tears, claiming she didn't know, and then said she was afraid she would get in trouble. While Lindsay probably thought that by sharing this detail, she might help her case, but if anything, it made her look worse. She had just admitted, while on tape, that she had not been entirely honest with investigators since the beginning, they would now have even more of a reason not to trust her. At this point, it seemed as if Lindsay became more of an open book, and she finally confessed that one of Hannah's injuries was the result of her hitting her. I slapped her upside the head. With what? My hand. I slapped her upside the head, she told investigators. She claimed to have done this with her hand. She said that the reason she did it was because Hannah had taken the ketchup bottle and squirted it all out into the toilet. She claimed that she didn't believe the hit, which she had done with a closed fist had actually hurt the little girl. Her story gets even darker when she begins to describe to investigators what she did to Hannah after the little girl was first dropped off at her house by her dad. She didn't want me to go to work. And he's like, I gotta go, I gotta go. So he rushed out and I was like, Hannah, you can't do that. Daddy, you gotta go to work. You showed her. Yeah. I shook her and I remember we came out and squeezing her and we did ball. She admitted that she had shaken Hannah while she was angry. Shortly after, Lindsay was finally arrested. She was charged with child endangerment, manslaughter, and murder. What happens next is a highly interesting trial with many ups and downs, and Lindsay tries to profess 
her innocence. Her legal team tried to say that because the incident had happened so soon after Hannah had been dropped off at Lindsay's house, that she had to have been injured before she arrived. Attorney Catherine Smith explained that the trouble with this case is identifying how the trauma occurred. Investigators can determine what types of trauma the individual has sustained, but because they weren't there, they can't say exactly how the trauma occurred. So that's why that's always a battle of the experts. Reflecting back on the case, Judge Brandon Birmingham says that it came down to the autopsy. The autopsy shows beyond any doubt that this child died as a result of homicide. This child died as a result of inflicted trauma. The defense experts testified that these injuries, although they do exist, didn't necessarily manifest themselves in one certain time frame that you could pinpoint of who was responsible. In other words, Lindsay's defense was trying to say that there was no way of proving that Hannah received these injuries while within Lindsay's care, but that they could have happened at any point in time, whether at her own house or someplace else. Some medical professionals did agree with their assessment, which brought on the question, if it wasn't Lindsay who hurt Hannah, who was? Could it have been her father? Jason Westchie, already crushed and broken over the loss of his beloved daughter, now would have to take the stand to try and prove that he had not harmed Hannah. Lindsay's defense team tried to get into Jason's head while questioning him, trying to convince him that Hannah's injuries could have occurred while the little girl was in his vehicle because he drove forward too quickly. Is that when Hannah fell in the back seat and hit her head? But Jason denied that this ever occurred. Hannah never fell in the back seat. While he was actively grieving and under pressure to defend himself in court, Jason would at times confuse small details of his accounts of the days leading up to Hannah's hospitalization. For example, at one point he said that on the night before Hannah's attack allegedly occurred, he had gone to the store to get some milk. He later changed his story and said he hadn't gone to the store that night. While this detail sounds small and innocent enough, the defense tried to act like this mistake was enough to make Jason untrustworthy, and they even went as far to say that he had lied. You lied to the police about milk and Walmart, correct? He responded that he had just been confused. I was confused, just yes, ma'am. Because he was going through so much trauma, it made sense that these slight inconsistencies with his story occurred. The next person to take the stand would be Lindsay herself. When prosecutors asked Lindsay if she believed that it was okay for her to slap Hannah across the face, her response was quite sickening. Ms. Pern, did you think that, that you could slap her across the face? I have known other moms to do that. That's not so what I asked So I didn't me. think that it was an issue as a type of discipline. While on the stand, she changes her story once more. She takes back what she said about hitting Hannah and slapping her head on the day she was first hospitalized. When asked why she lied about this, she had a strange response. Why did you tell the police that you did? Because I wanted to protect everybody. Her voice thick with tears. She claimed it was Jason she wanted to protect. When she was asked why she would want to defend someone who she believed had caused such horrible injuries to a child, her answer didn't make a whole lot of sense. Because I care about him, he was my friend. Just wanted to protect everybody. I didn't want anybody to be in trouble. She claimed that she always looked for the best in people and did the same with Jason. But even if she was lying, she was making herself look very bad in the eyes of the jury because she was basically saying that she was willing to protect Jason over Hannah. If she had really cared about Hannah and her well being, then she would have turned Jason in at the beginning. By failing to do this, she would be partially responsible for what happened. As for why Lindsay said that she had admitted to hitting Hannah, she claimed that the police had tricked her into giving this confession when it was actually false. She said that she believed that police had already decided that she was guilty and weren't going to change their minds. She felt like no matter what she said, they would think she was lying, so she simply told them what she thought they wanted to hear. This, of course, made little sense. I felt pressured, I felt forced, I wanted to protect everybody, I felt bullied. Putting a defendant on the stand to testify for themselves is often a risky move and was likely a mistake in this case. Lindsay at times appeared condescending and rude, making herself out to look even worse than she already did. Finally, on April 12, 2019, Lindsay would have to face the music 
and she was found guilty. On May 9th of 2019, Lindsay would then be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. If she behaves herself and can prove that she's trying to do better, she may make parole. However, there is a very real possibility that she will spend the rest of her life in prison. While Jason now has justice for the death of his daughter, he will never have what he really wants, which is to get Hannah back. Even though years have gone by, he has found little relief. It's something that's in my mind every single day. Time doesn't make anything easier. Um, it makes it rougher. Try to go day by day. Jason, who was not allowed in the courtroom when Lindsay testified, still does not understand how anyone could have ever truly believed that it was okay to beat a child the way she did. He hopes that she does not make parole. This case involves the horrific and of an innocent one-year-old boy who had barely even begun his life yet. The victim in this case was Anthony Delgado. He was an adorable little boy with a charming smile. His mother, Marta, was in the process of moving and needed someone to watch her baby for one weekend in February in the year 2016. The woman she chose for the job was a neighbor of hers named Gloria Fields. Marta believed that she could trust Gloria to take proper care of her young son while she took care of matters related to the move. Had Marta had any idea of the horrific things Gloria would put her son through, she likely would not have allowed for him to go anywhere near her. A friend of Marta's described how much the young mom cared about her son. She cared about her baby uh, very much. All she cared about was, you know, her baby. What Marta didn't know at the time was that Gloria didn't have the best reputation within the community. I didn't know her as a babysitter. She's not known for being no babysitter. Everyone that knows her knows that she's unstable, knows that she does... Anthony's tragic fate would be discovered on February 21st of 2016 after a 911 call was made asking police to come to a Staten Island apartment to save an injured child. When paramedics very shortly after the call was made arrived at the scene, there were people who had been trying to revive the child, but unfortunately, he had already passed. His apparent cause of death was cardiac arrest. Prior to ever knowing what was going on with her child, Marta did receive a text from Gloria that Sunday in which she claimed little Anthony had fallen while they were traveling to Manhattan. She did not let on how severe his injuries were, but Marta was still a bit concerned. She could have never expected how dire her son's condition really was or how much danger he was in at that exact moment that Gloria had sent that text. In fact, at that point, her child had already been knocked unconscious. It wouldn't take long for the medical professionals who examined the child's body to determine that he certainly hadn't sustained his injuries from any fall. He had been abused, horrifically, and by someone much bigger and stronger than he was. He had both internal and external injuries that ultimately led to his death. The only people who could have done this to a defenseless child were Gloria and her boyfriend. They were both quickly taken to the police station for questioning. Initially, Gloria tried to blame the whole thing on her boyfriend, and she claimed that she had nothing to do with the abuse poor Anthony had endured in the last three days of his life. It took police 40 hours of questioning Gloria before she finally broke down and told the truth. It was her who had and ultimately child. Luckily, Gloria would have to pay for what she did. On May 25th of 2016, she was charged with an array of charges, including murder, child endangerment, and assault. As police looked into Gloria's background and the background of her boyfriend, they would soon learn what dangerous people they really were. Gloria had been arrested nine times before, while her boyfriend had been arrested a shocking 25 times. They were clearly not good people who should have never been trusted to take care of a vulnerable child. In fact, Gloria had been actively engaging in illicit substances the whole weekend she was watching Anthony, so she was not even in the right mind to care for anyone, let alone someone else's child. Gloria's abuse of Anthony didn't just occur behind the privacy of closed doors, but even in public where others could see. She clearly had no shame for the pain she was inflicting on an innocent child. One of the places she had stopped that weekend was a used clothing store in Buffalo. The 
it continued there, but people either didn't notice or just didn't want to say anything. The details of what Gloria did to Anthony are almost too disturbing and grisly to bear. She not only shook him and beat him, but she slammed him to the ground while he was strapped to his stroller. At one point, she even a pencil into his body, causing his still forming organs to tear open. She left the pencil there for hours. His tiny body was bruised and he had lacerations everywhere. There were marks on every part of his body except for his feet. The DA's office put out a statement regarding the horrific that Anthony endured at the hands of a woman who should have been protecting him. For 48 hours, this depraved woman systematically a 16 month old baby. No creature on this earth, let alone an innocent child, deserves to go through such a horrific torment, the statement said. Anthony's loved ones were visibly upset as they were approached by reporters outside of the courthouse. She needs to be punished for what she's done. You can't do this. There was a human being, there was a little baby. It was only a baby. Wow, I just wanted to break down. I wanted to break down because I had no idea that all of that took place. What Gloria did was so unimaginably horrific that her legal team could think of no reasonable way to defend her, except by claiming that she was insane. Claiming insanity in a court case doesn't often work, and it often only applies when an individual commits a crime in one particular moment. But what Gloria did was systematic. It was not just one mistake, but a that continued for days upon end. She felt no sympathy for the child. One of the reasons that Gloria's legal team was considering using insanity was because of one particular quote taken from one of her interviews. I just blacked out. I was off my meds. I swear I'm not a bad person, she told investigators. Not believing the insanity route would work, Gloria's legal team instead decided to use a different strategy. They claimed that police had tricked and pressured Gloria into confessing when she was never really the one who committed the crimes. She would initially plead not guilty and the trial moved forward. She would end up changing her plea to guilty later on. On the day that Gloria was to be sentenced in court, some of Anthony's loved ones came forward to provide a victim impact statement and discuss what the loss of the little boy meant to them. Because Marta was understandably too upset to comment herself, she wrote a statement that she would have her brother, Emmanuel, read. He struggled to make his way through the statement and became visibly emotional at certain parts. I would never be able to buy Anthony another bag of cheese doodles. Many of the people in the courtroom could be heard sobbing as the statement was read. I do not understand in what world it might be acceptable to ever allow an individual who not only I'm, I'm just gonna end that there, I can't read that part. Unable to read the part of the statement that referenced what Gloria had done to the child with the pencil. Gloria was forced to listen as Anthony's family members relayed the pain they were in as a result of her actions. She had initially tried to get out of going to the courtroom that day out of fear for not only facing the family, but of being filmed. But the judge would ultimately force her to attend. Emmanuel felt that Gloria's initial refusal to enter the courtroom was very cowardly. To me, that, that was being like a coward, you wouldn't face the people who you have affected. State Supreme Court Justice Wayne Ozzy really lit into Gloria at the sentencing. This is the most disturbing case I've ever presided over. I was watching you as Mr. Delgado gave his statement. You showed no emotion. It just confirms my belief that you are just depraved in some way, he said. The only reason that Gloria could give in regards to why she did what she did was that she was in pain and wanted to inflict pain on someone else. She chose Anthony as her defenseless victim, but claimed she never meant to actually <laughs> Gloria did not apologize or even address Anthony's family at all in court. She showed no emotion and especially no sympathy. She was eventually sentenced 23 years to life in prison. Some people believe that she deserved a worse punishment. Following the sentencing, Emmanuel spoke of the family's relief that Gloria would pay for the horrific acts that she committed. The justice was served. Anthony got justice and that's all that, that matters to us. But of course it will not be enough to bring little Anthony back. This was something that the defense lawyer for Miss Gloria Maria Gallucci acknowledged after the sentencing. Probably one of the toughest cases I've ever had to uh, defend before. 
but you saw the emotions in the courtroom. He went on to say that Gloria has been given adequate punishment and that there were no winners in regards to this case. Uh, 23 years to life is a significant amount of time. There's a very good possibility she may never get out of jail. This next story takes place in the quiet village of Cambridge in the UK. The year was 2002, and two 10-year-old best friends named Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells were reunited once again after Jessica and her family had gone away for a brief vacation. On August 4th of 2002, Jessica could hardly wait to see Holly and tell her about her trip. She also had a gift she had brought back that she intended to give her. Holly's parents were planning to host a cookout that night, and they told Jessica that she could come over, eat, and enjoy some time with Holly. When Jessica arrived, the girls ended up changing into matching orange football jerseys, each with the name Beckham on the back. After sharing a meal together, the girls played in Holly's room for a while before deciding that they were craving something sweet. There happened to be a sweet shop just a short walking distance away from Holly's home that they decided to go to. They didn't tell any adults that they were leaving because they likely planned to be gone for only a short period of time. They left Holly's house at around 6.15 p.m. that evening and headed in the direction of the candy shop. All the while that they were gone, Holly's mother believed the girls were still upstairs hanging out in Holly's bedroom. At around 8.20 p.m., she called out the girls' names, but nobody responded. She went up to Holly's room and realized nobody was there. She wasn't immediately very worried as it wasn't quite time for the girls' curfews yet, and she just assumed that they were playing outside or had gone to Jessica's house. But as time went on and the girls still didn't show, Holly's mom called Jessica's mom and was told that the girls hadn't been by. It was getting late and both families were getting worried. The girls' fathers went out searching for them but had no luck. They ultimately decided to call the police and report them missing just before 10 p.m. that evening. That night, an enormous search party came together in the hopes of combing through the town to find Jessica and Holly. Police checked local security camera footage and were able to get a pretty good idea of what route the girls had taken through town. They had in fact made it to the candy shop and were seen by witnesses along the way. After getting their treats, the girls were seen holding each other arm in arm as they skipped in the direction of Holly's home. They were skipping, talking excitedly, and laughing, but they would never make it home that night. Police would eventually find out that along the way, the girls had stopped to speak with a man named Ian Huntley. Ian was a caretaker at their school, and his girlfriend, a woman named Maxine Carr, had once been a teacher's assistant in their classroom. They wanted to know how Maxine had been. After speaking with Ian for only a short while, they continued on their path home. Because Ian was the last known person that the girls had spoken with before disappearing, it made sense that police were very interested in talking with him. The story he gave them was that his dog had escaped for a brief while and gotten muddy in the process. He had been standing on the porch, cleaning off the dog with a horse when the girls came by. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was. She used to teach them at St. Andrews. Um, I just said she weren't very good and she hadn't got the job. And they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry and uh, off the walk in the direction of the, um, the library over there. The job he was referring to was a full-time teaching job at the school. During this video interview, Ian would appear calm, cool, and collected, almost too calm. His girlfriend, Maxine, was also interviewed later on, and she spoke quite highly of the girls. However, at one particular point in the interview, she accidentally spoke of Holly in the past tense, saying, She was just lovely. She really lovely. This could only lead investigators to wonder if she knew more than she was letting on. As the investigation continued on, it would seem that Maxine may have been trying to cover up for her boyfriend, Ian. She had initially said she was taking a bath when Ian first told her about the girls going missing, but in fact, she was out of town entirely, visiting with her mother. This is important because it would turn out that she could not provide an alibi for Ian for the night Holly and Jessica disappeared. As police would further look into Ian's history, they would soon find that he had a history of violence and he had even been caught being violent towards Maxine while in public in some occasions. He had a charming yet manipulative personality and he was even known for being infatuated with younger girls. Girls much like Holly and Jessica. 
Unfortunately, despite the town's best efforts to find the girls, their bodies would later be discovered lying in a ditch just 32 miles away. They had both been not only extremely abused, but their bodies had decomposed almost beyond the point of recognition. The girls had no broken bones, and it was believed that they both died of suffocation. It was eventually determined that around where the girls' bodies had been discovered, a mark that matched up with Ian's tire tread was found in the soil. On August 20th, Huntley was eventually arrested and charged with the two counts of murder. Because Maxine Carr had lied to the police about the girls' well-being, she also faced three and a half years in prison. Meanwhile, Ian had claimed that he was not guilty in connection with the murders. The jury would not believe his conviction and he ended up being sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment for what he did. 